Christian. I think that was a very useful contribution uh, that complemented the, um, the, the perspectives on the single countries. Um, I would like to now um, open the floor to questions and answers. I have, we have already received some in the, um, in the chat box. Um, why don't we start with the economic uh, one and then we will move on to the um, political security questions. Um, let's start with the one from Professor Prabir to Professor Tran. Um, are you able to see that in the chat box? Professor Tran? Yes, I see that. Uh... Okay. So the question for those of you who are not able to access the chat box, um, um, Professor Prabir has pointed out that um, um, if the SSA stands for Sub-Saharan African countries can buy a lot from ASEAN and India, then what will ASEAN and India buy from them? And he yeah. observes that Africa uh, continental uh, free trade agreement and the RCEP are two overarching trade agreements and he, he asks Professor Tran if he thinks they should both be connected and without Japan's involvement how feasible is this AAGC? Uh, it seems to be another geopolitical nomenclature. Um, yes. Okay, I would like to invite uh, Professor Tran to respond to this question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, I, I'm sorry because I didn't have enough time to uh, describe uh, the, the trade patterns between Asia and Africa. But before answering to this question, I, I, would, uh, I just want to remind that um, the weight of such uh, South South trees is uh, rather low, barely about 1% of exports and less than 1% of imports from ASEAN uh, are, is devoted to Sub-Saharan Africa. And on the opposite, ASEAN account for less than 4% of ASEAN trade. So it is rather small. However, I think that uh, we have some um, interesting facts behind their, their trade. Let me just re uh, answer to, to the question. Actually, ASEAN uh, exports a wide range of consumer products to Sub-Saharan Africa, like for instance, processed food and beverage. That's why I was talking about resource intensive export of sectors. And they also ex uh, export uh, textiles, clothing, footwear, um, electronics, against primary products coming from Sub-Saharan Africa, like pine oil, cotton, copra, copper. So what I mean here is that you have a kind of um, uh, complementarity between ASEAN and Sub-Saharan Africa. But my talk was about how could we develop further trade between the two regions? And that is why I was talking about inter-industry trade because both regions participate in global value chains and they have the opportunities to diversify the export in specific category or industry. That was my, my main motivation here. Uh, did I answer to the question, the first one? Um, I can take another example. Uh, some Asian members import from Mauritius uh, textile and footwear, and they also import from South Africa building materials or electronic products because South Africa is uh, the African economy, which is engaged uh, heavily in global value chains. That is why we can build up a kind of networking between Sub-Saharan Africa and Asian members. And regarding the second part of uh, the question, AAGC means Africa, Asia growth corridor. And uh, uh, behind this uh, strategy, we have India and Japan with some African economies which have signed a kind of uh, partnership in building up infrastructure and connectivity. And that is why in my first part, I try to highlight the fact that it is not enough to build up uh, trade pillars between ASEAN and Sub-Saharan Africa. Even though infrastructure is a good point to develop, but it is not enough. We have to provide 
because there's huge economic literature dedicated to uh, firms' location. And we need to develop also service like electricity, um, connectivity is not enough. And the second part of my uh, presentation was also dedicated to what could ASEAN, I mean the developing countries of ASEAN, uh, what could they do to support such South-South trade? Uh, it's not only about India and Japan, it's also to diversify their trade relationships. And we can see clearly when we look at trade patterns between both regions that some leading countries can, uh, uh, can draw the path. I mean, like Singapore, Singapore is the only country in the ASEAN committee, which has many different, a full networking with the other ASEAN members. And South Africa has the same leading role and the same network um, pattern in South Southern Africa. That is why we can build up such kind of South-South trade partnership. But obviously it is not exclusive. We need other uh, countries like India and Japan, because as I told you, Infrastructure, connectivity are very important and determinants. But to improve the foreign market access, such as Southern Africa needs other developing countries to diversify the export portfolio. That was my main uh, talk today. Was it clear? And did I respond to the question? Yeah, that's fine. And we can have bilateral, you know, later on. We can go on with the next questions. Uh, yeah, I think that there's great opportunities because actually uh, the bilateral trade is really slow, less than 1% for, Ase um, for ASEAN and about 4% for Sub-Saharan Africa. That is why I try to uh, develop the idea that we could improve further this partnership between both uh, Southern you. and developing regions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Oh, yeah. We have a couple of questions um, directed to uh, Dr. Van Arith and to Shafia. Um, let's start with, we have another one here to, to both on the South China Sea and the Mekong and Lanchang um, being a theater of rivalry. Asks whether you agree. Okay, so which one should we do first? Um, shall we start with the general one first and then we go to the more specific one on the US-China rivalry. So can we start with the one on um, to both Shafia and Vanarith? Both of you picked up on the uh, lack of political leadership in the region. Uh, can you elaborate on what this means to you? Sure, can I start or Banner, do yes. you want to start? Either, or, either of you? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a chance. Uh, and Banner can, of course, um, um, add more uh, to it later. I'm pretty sure okay. he has, um, 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 his, his answers as well, uh, which is very interesting. I think, um, you know, yeah, talking about political leadership uh, required in ASEAN, uh, what's interesting is that um, ASEAN has not actually finished defining what leadership it what leadership is and what leadership fits for for ASEAN. Uh, the association is loosely built. Um, actually, my uh, my team and I at CSIS we're actually conducting a research uh, currently on uh, on leadership in ASEAN, basically, and focusing on the uh, possibility of you know what 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 is generally acclaimed as the Indonesian leadership in ASEAN. And it's been very interesting looking at the history that um, of of ASEAN, you know, since the 1960s until now. Um, what is called what is understood as leadership in ASEAN has actually not been in line with all these theories about leadership uh, in political science in general, uh, because uh, in part it was normative, but then in parts, uh, uh, depending on, on 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 the period and depending on the uh, on the domestic situation in some ASEAN countries, it was also a personal um, situation uh, when one country. Uh, has a very strong leader and that, that strong leader would also you know exert leadership in ASEAN as well. 
But then you fast forward to, uh, you know, to, to, to now, to, to 2021, and it's a different story again, and different types of leadership occur, occur in ASEAN. So I think this is, this is something that is, you know, requiring a very close research on, you know, what kind of, um, you know, what kind of um, leadership does ASEAN really need? And I think this is something that is still not properly answered uh, by all the countries in ASEAN at the moment. And also very interesting is that, you know, leadership in ASEAN is also understood differently when you're talking about different issues in political security, in economy, uh, in, in other issues, you know, uh, um, the countries, uh, all 10 countries, all 10 member countries of ASEAN want different things, uh, want different types of leadership when it comes to different issues. So um, I'm afraid this is a very uh, difficult answer to to um, to give, and I think this is something that is requiring further research uh, for those of us interested in ASEAN. Okay, well I have a response to that. Well, I'm finishing up a book on this very issue, sure. um, and I'm rewriting some of the chapters, and I'd love to have a chat with you on that on the uh, Indonesian uh, leaders. Okay, and Dr. Vanari. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to reading your book, actually. <laughs> we, we don't have an answer to this, but it, it can be a combination of three elements, right? Uh, institutional, normative, and uh, charisma, uh, charismatic leadership. Um, so I, I think this is something that still lacking uh, when we have a dialogue across Southeast Asia. We, we want to enhance ASEAN, but we don't know really, you know, how understand, I mean, know how to enhance the, the, the leadership, political leadership of ASEAN at the regional and also at the national level. So I think your work will, will be critical and looking forward to it. Thank you. Okay, maybe we should have a trilateral chat sometime. I'd love to, to, to talk to you about uh, the leadership of Hun Sen. <laughs> okay, um, I think we have another question uh, from David Kamru, which is um, connected to the other uh, question on political leadership in ASEAN. Um, how can you, how do you both or all of you see uh, the conundrum of the ASEAN way and whether this hinders the place of strong leaders and how it can be resolved? Uh, anyone want to go first? Maybe Dr. Banneret? Thank you. Again, this is very important. Very tough questions too. Uh, we have been uh, talking about the ASEAN way for, I think, almost 20 years now, uh, the debate on ASEAN way. Uh, but I, I think that the conclusion of this is, uh, of course, ASEAN way very kind of fundamental to peace and stability, but it needs to be more flexible and more adaptive to, to the new situation and new environment. So ASEAN play, uh, Flexible ASEAN way, perhaps the, the only answer. Thank you. Shafia? Sure. Um, uh, this, is, this is also interesting because, um, you know, the, um, you want to try to connect between the ASEAN way uh, and the existing uh, of, a, of a strong leader in ASEAN. And I think it has been working different ways throughout the history. Uh, I think in, in, the, in the early days, you know, the ASEAN, the ASEAN way actually accentuates uh, uh, the existence of strong leaders in some states, uh, uh, especially among the original members of, of ASEAN. You know, having strong leaders in this uh, in, in number of countries actually allow uh, ASEAN way to function in a way that, you know, uh, decisions could be made very quickly once they meet, have a chat, uh, play golf, then decisions were, uh, were made. Uh, it actually allowed for, for strong leaders to actually make decisions in ASEAN. But if you take a look at now, then um, apparently, you know, ASEAN, ASEAN way has actually allowed for, you know, longer uh, versions of negotiations, uh, reaching consensus, and some way it becomes a, uh, uh, what do you call it, an, an excuse for actually not making decision because there is an ASEAN way. So I think it, it really depends again on the domestic situation of ASEAN, uh, of, the, uh, of the member countries of ASEAN, of certain member countries of ASEAN. Uh, and I think uh, ASEAN way has worked uh, differently uh, for, for ASEAN throughout the history. Um, Professor Cho Cho, I was wondering whether you could add your views on uh, what you uh, perceive as the leadership on ASEAN in Myanmar or from Myanmar? Uh, uh, instead of that uh, question, 
um, the leadership in ASEAN, it is really difficult for me to answer right now. So let me give a response uh, regarding with the ASEAN wave, my perspective on ASEAN wave. Uh, the situation right now um, uh, is uh, best suited for the ASEAN game because uh, ASEAN has come up uh, uh, with a consensus, uh, uh, consensus and uh, non-interference in the domestic affairs of the uh, member countries. And um, uh, uh, we have to bear in mind that ASEAN sustain because of the ASEAN way. So I'm not arguing that ASEAN should be flexible, but uh, on the you know, very sensitive case, ASEAN has to uh, come up with the uh, ASEAN will, which is a consensus building. So that is my opinion. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much for your interesting um, contributions. Um, now we will go to the question on to Dr. Vanerich. Uh, the question is in the chat box. In strengthening ASEAN's agency amid the US-China rivalry, do you foresee any role for the ASEAN Regional Forum um, as embodied in the Indo-Pacific in terms of its participants? Frankly, I, I don't see much role for ASEAN Regional Forum because the membership is too diverse, uh, but I could foresee the role of East Asia Summit and the ADM plus uh, in this regard. So I think talking about um, agency and the uh, ASEAN outlook in the Pacific, uh, that's why we, we need to, uh, how to say, we need to give more power to the East Asia Summit. I mean, based on the centrality of ASEAN, of course. So that mechanism will help us uh, to uh, kind of to diffuse the tensions in the Asia Pacific and to find some way for us to maneuver and navigate. Thank you. Uh, Shafia, do you have any opinion on this question? I'll pass on this one, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, do we have more questions? We have, we have one more question. Um, in addition to the South China Sea, the Mekong Lanchang region is also becoming a theater of rivalry between the US, China, and India. Do you agree? Uh, Dr. Vanarit? Yes, uh, I do agree. Um, I could feel it uh, because I'm also working with some policymakers in the Mekong and the heat is going up. Uh, the EU also drafting the EU Mekong strategy. So EU is coming. Australia already came. Uh, with uh, 230 million. And the EU is drafting now the, the, the strategy toward the Mekong. So many actors in the Mekong and very dynamics. But I think if it's smart, then we can get benefits from all sides. But I think, of course, China is the, the dominant one uh, in the Mekong. Okay. Is that all the questions we have? Um... So, Professor Lau, would you like to comment? Uh, yes, actually, uh, Dr. Panitan, are you still there? Sorry, yes, yes, madam. Yes, um, can, we, um, can we have your views on the last few questions? Because you didn't turn your, um, your uh, um, screen on. I, I didn't. I, I couldn't see you. So I would like your views uh, on on political leadership in ASEAN. Uh, given that you talked about Thailand's uh, former leadership and your skepticism as to whether this could be continued, uh, because in my view, I think ASEAN uh, Thailand is still a very much a leader within ASEAN uh, in terms of coming up with new ideas. Um, um, maintaining uh, the momentum in existing uh, regional cooperation and, and so on. So um, I, would, I would like your views on political leadership first and then on the other questions that we had raised earlier as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. My apology for not turning on the camera, <laughs> uh, but uh, 
uh, I have been listening quite interestingly in, in many of the questions. I think the first question from Mr. David Kamrox, uh, another ASEAN expert from Europe uh, on political leadership is very critical as I think number one, we are moving toward a transitional period of leadership in the next few years. Uh, many aging uh, leaders are stepping down or have been affected greatly by in, an inability to solve the crises, including the COVID-19 and recently the Myanmar issue. Uh, in particular, number two, Madam Chair, uh, uh, colleagues yes. and, and listeners, uh, I think officially uh, leadership of ASEAN could be uh, uh, as usual, concerted effort, not interference, uh, very uh, positive outlook officially. But my observation, and I'm afraid that uh, in the short and medium term, the disagreements regarding certain issues, including in particular, uh, issue of Myanmar could prevent some of these ASEAN countries uh, to work closely. For example, I'm not even sure to be frank that uh, Myanmar leaders appreciate the comments from Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore uh, as compared to other countries. Will this hamper uh, the real corporations behind the scene since ASEAN depends very much on a very much inofficial uh, uh, capacity to communicate. Uh, not to mention that uh, now the retreat is not uh, quite uh, effective as ASEAN leaders have to be uh, uh, online working together. So I, my real concern is this uh, in the short and medium term. The challenge is of course, is to see how this delayed uh, observer team, which is agreed upon already, in the last uh, few weeks, uh, we'll be moving forward. Uh, the three-person uh, team uh, will be accepted and move forward. I think that that's that's my 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 observation on on this. But yes, secondly and shortly, I think uh, I agree with Dr. Wanarit uh, that there are some positive outcomes in a smaller uh, groups of cooperation multilaterally. For example, uh, the ADMM Plus is quite positive, I think, but they are not leaders uh, of the state. They are not head of the state, but these different ministers have been working quite, quite effectively uh, in many areas, in many issues, uh, bilaterally and multilaterally to ASEAN, ASEAN Medical Center and many other uh, uh, corporations. This is what Ajahn Surin Pitsuwan envisioned before he passed away, that one day ASEAN defense ministries will form a, a much needed uh, forces in terms of humanitarian relief. And I think the AHA Center uh, will be another focus you know, in, the next, in the near future as we are now moving into the recovery period. So I agree with uh, Dr. Wanarit that we, we may depend less so uh, on the big uh, high level leadership, but uh, a second level, you know, the minister's level, the senior minister's level, we may depending on uh, this cooperation, uh, the uh, ACMIC, for example, Madam Chair, uh, is, is going well with Thailand and, and neighboring countries, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, for example, are, are quite, quite good in this regard. Uh, so that's a positive outcome also. Uh, I'm sure that lastly, uh, ASEAN really need a new kind of leadership uh, for the future. Uh, the confrontation between the superpowers are real you know, and pressing, judging from many observers. They are heading toward uh, wars, if not conflict. So it needs a real skillful uh, diplomats and leadership to navigate this uh, using both bi bilateral and uh, multilateral capacity. It is very clear that ASEAN alone in the next few years will not be enough uh, to handle this situation. But luckily, the United Nations sees this important of ASEAN. So I'm quite positive, having, having been said on these negative things, but I'm still remain positive, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Panitan. 
Actually, I had one more question, which I saw in um, Dr. Vanneris slide. It was quite obscure. It was one line. But I wanted to ask you about your views on the ASEAN Global Dialogue, because I was involved in organizing it way back in 2012. Uh, Dr. Actually, are you asking me or asking Dr. Vanovic? Uh, uh, both of you. I, I'm sure both of you were involved in, um, or you know something about the initiative of Dr. Surin Pitsuan, which was the ASEAN Global Dialogue, which the idea was to bring together the, uh, the heads of all the multilateral institutions together with the heads of the EAS to brainstorm on the future of ASEAN. Um, and at the time, I think um, the idea was, you know, it was a bit too early um, but uh, it's interesting that you have picked it up in this, uh, in your presentation, Dr. Vanaris, and, or, and I think um, Dr. Panitan also, you would have your, we would like to hear your strategic insights on the idea and whether you see uh, what your prospects of the idea is. Because I think um, the multilateral institutions have a long history in the region. And so they have collected a lot of not only data, but experiences as well that can be shared and that could be used to strengthen uh, ASEAN's institutions in the, in the boring paper sense, you know, in, the, in, in terms of coming up with the concepts, the terminology, the, te the technology infrastructure and all of this. Um, so I, I would like to hear your views on this. Um, Who well, would like to go first? Maybe Dr. Wanderit, and then I'll share some of the last words that Dan Surin Pitsuwan sent me from Geneva. Uh, on this issue, just a few uh, days before he passed away. Uh, okay. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Wanderit. Thank you. Yes, yeah, you are right. It, it was uh, uh, inspired by uh, uh, Suran uh, uh Dr. Soksikwana is, is the one that initiated it, and he is the chairman of my institute now. Uh, and he's a senior advisor to Cambodian government. I'm now working with him. Oh, okay. great. To, uh, to uh, develop the concept note for ASEAN Global Dialogue uh, for next year. So he, he's a pioneer and uh, he very much inspired by Suren Persuan. So thanks to him, it's perhaps it's one, of his, one of his legacy for ASEAN is the ASEAN Global Dialogue. Okay. And uh, uh, this is something that we want to uh, connect ASEAN with other multilateral institutions, um, like the UN, World Bank, IMF, and so on. Okay. Uh, I would. I would love to have a chat with you on that, but next, next in another round. Uh, Dr. Panitan? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, I remember very well, late at night, uh, Serene sent me a message. Uh, he was very much excited by these ideas and he told me that he will share more later on on, on the details, but uh, he highlighted uh, uh, key uh, elements and issues that Dr. Manarit already talked about. It for ASEAN uh, to move forward, uh, to connect with the global and, 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 and other regional communities, uh, including uh, Pacific uh, issues uh, on human rights, uh, Pacific issues in terms of environment, uh, Pacific issues on, on, on the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, humanitarian reliefs, uh, using Thailand's capacity, using ASEAN capacity, uh, using some of the uh, countries in ASEAN to lead uh, some of these uh, 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 dialogues uh, without moving the whole ASEAN if not ready. In other words, I was seeing Surin Pitsuwan's uh, ideas of old Troika, the, uh, the uh, friends, of, uh, mm -hmm. friends of chairs uh, in a new light. Uh, he was very much excited. And, and a few days later, I invited him to talk about this uh, at my institute at that time, the, King Pachatipok Institute, but he passed away before he came to the, uh, to the uh, uh, meeting. I sent uh, my student to interview him uh, the morning that he passed away. Uh, he passed away in the afternoon. Indeed, we, we are now looking back and trying to uh, see what Surin's uh, initiation can move forward. You know? uh, but I'm sure Dr. Wanarit uh, now working on that. Uh, in the end, Surin told us that we need to move the we need to put a more human face in ASEAN and move ASEAN to the regional and, and, and global uh, uh, stages um, using the capacity that we have in Thailand, our capacity in terms of uh, uh, human humanitarian release, you know, capacity that we used to do uh, in many countries, including in Timor-Leste. 
So those are his words, uh, as I remembered. Uh, but I, I need to go back to, to that interview just hours before uh, he passed away to be able to, to tell more details on this issue. Thank you so much, Dr. Panitan. Um, do we have more questions? I think we would like to invite uh, Professor Lau Sin Yi. He has some questions uh, and comments. Oh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. Well, it's not, it's not actually a, um, a question, neither is a comment. I just want to offer a suggestion to Professor uh, Ting An Dao regarding uh, her research. I think her research can do better that if you look, if you position Sub-Saharan <coughs> uh, Sub Africa trade with India or ASEAN, not as inter-regional trade, and you put it as an intra-regional region, trade of Indian Ocean, then you can convert that analysis into intra-industry trade. And that intra-industry trade basically will give you answer the strength of integration between Sub-Saharan Africa and India, the other side of the Indian Ocean Rim. And in intra-industry analysis, you need to split into two. One is the horizontal intra-industry trade. The other one is vertical intra-industry trade. The former horizontal intra-industry trade basically give rise to the issue of differentiation of similar product. For example, a television. A television may have a hard disk which may carry 100 gigabyte, all right? And another higher value TV may have remote, con remote con uh, control and other uh, facilities or, or, or other options that you can put in that. Vertical intra-industry uh, division labels simply give you, you want to sell higher value product a higher value added product, for example, clothes. But at the same time, you do not want to buy higher value added clothes. Instead, you buy a lower value added clothes. So this differentiation will determine what are the steps of strengthening industrial development or trade manufacturing uh, advantages and followed by that line of analysis, you are dealing with what are the issue of concern to attract more direct from direct investment. And at the same time, what are the fiscal infrastructure that need to put in place? So with that kind of analytical finding, then you will have a clearer picture of what brings to the policy recommendation to, to, the, to the table. And that I thought will be very relevant. Uh, of course, this is not a very simple analysis. You will take you a, a, a lot of time uh, to get it done. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, everybody. Um, it looks like we've gone through all of these questions. Um, uh, I just want to thank one Professor Lau Simye for his valuable comments, if you don't mind. Um, okay. Just a, a, a short answer. My presentation was not about India. And as you can see in my title, it was dedicated. I was focused on ASEAN and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is uh, my first answer. I'm sorry because maybe I was uh, misunderstood, but I didn't talk about India. I was talking about ASEAN and specifically the ASEAN developing economies and their uh, partnership with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. My second answer is that I'm not working on at the firm level, but at the country level. That is the reason why I just mentioned global value chains, but I didn't uh, develop further about global value chains. This is not my topic. I wanted only to describe the patterns of trade between both regions at the country level, not at the firm level. So to respond to your uh, comments, that well, okay thank you. For, thank you for your thank you for your comment. From what understanding of your reply, if there is no point, then therefore, to analysis interregional trade because interregional trade will not bring you any policy recommendation from your findings because you have to, unless you go to eight digits of of SITC, which yes. give you a very final product. All right, 
but issue is you're going to do intra-regional trade you have to include you know even iran even india bangladesh and all this all right and moreover this country do not have intensity of trade with sub-saharan africa so the, the data, data itself are available but the, the the calculation of them is very simple because you you don't have so many products uh for uh for analysis right yeah and so there's no harm doing intra-regional trade instead of focusing on inter-regional trade to me it, it has no meaning at all if you look if you are talking about indo-pacific region thank you okay. thank you professor Lau. okay thank you any more questions from the floor from the participants um okay none Okay, so thank you again very much for your um, contributions and for all the speakers for pre presenting such beautiful slides and for so many uh, detailed uh, comments on, on ASEAN. I, I think we, we have learned a lot today and we've also met uh, some, made some new connections on, that we can uh, follow up on later on on our, on our mutually, uh, the topics that we are both interested in. Uh, thank you and I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>